I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would, your word would have its way with us, that your spirit, that your spirit this morning would winnow out the chaff in our lives and make us more and more in conformity to the image of your son. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, last time we were together, which I know has been two weeks now, and so we're going to do a little bit of a refresher. We looked at John the Baptist coming and preaching a message of repentance. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand or the kingdom of God has drawn near. And a good way to think through this kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven coming near, is the Lord's Prayer. Now, if there's any prayer that you likely know, especially since you were here this morning, um, it might be, now I lay me down to sleep, um, which is a good, helpful prayer. I mean, that's a, that's a biblical prayer. But I'm going to bet most of you know the Lord's Prayer inside and out, right? So thinking through this idea, the kingdom of heaven come near, consider how the Lord taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done, where? On earth as it is in heaven. Now here's our dilemma. You see, the reason why Jesus taught his disciples to pray like this is not because God's will was already being done on earth as it is in heaven but because that is the goal. That is what is going to take place. God's will is not yet done perfectly on earth as it is in heaven, at least not his revealed will. And so we, I mentioned last week that the one place God's will tends, his revealed will tends not to be done most is in the hearts of sinful, fallen human beings. God's prescribed righteousness found in a joyful obedience, grounded in trusting and delighting in God, has not been carried out on earth as it is in heaven. But around God's throne, just think about it, angels are in constant worship singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. While on earth, even those of us who claim to know Christ, I'm going to guess if your life is a lot like mine, your life is not one of constant worship and adoration of our King. It's not. So what's the remedy? Try harder? You know, I'm going to try a bit harder this week and I'll get, you know, get those boots laced up good. We've all tried it. It's not going to work. You can try however hard you want. That's not the solution. Well, I titled this message or this series of messages, Preparing the Way, and I get that from Isaiah 40. We are called, in a very real sense, to prepare the path of the Lord, to make his path straight for the Lord's coming to us. And the extent of that, our, clearing, our, our preparing the way, is removing every obstacle that stands between us and God. Lowering mountains, raising valleys, smoothing out the rough places. And what I covered last time was the one thing that stands in our way between us and God is our sin. But the problem is the most you and I are able to do in preparing the way of the Lord is that of repentance. We can repent, and we talked about that in class earlier. The most we can do is repent, and then we move forward. Now, when we think of repentance, and I say the most we can do is repent, 
some people might you know well what about sharing the gospel and what about um, discipleship all that falls under the category of repentance because when we look at our lives um, we're called to walk in God's ways so if we're not already doing that to turn and walk in his ways and we're called to continue walking in his ways and so as we look at our lives every aspect of it is to turn and conform it to the image of Christ. That is what repentance is, turning and walking in God's ways. That includes evangelism, because part of Jesus' ways is sharing the good news with others. So if you're not doing it, our repentance is to go and make sure we're sharing the good news with others. So conversion and discipleship are an act of repentance. It is a continual act of this repentance. Any place we see where our lives are not meshing perfectly with Jesus, and if your life is anything like mine, it's not yet, we need to redirect our course. All right. That is the extent of what you and I are able to do to prepare the way of the Lord and for his kingdom. And that's actually our first point. The extent of what you and I can do to prepare the way is that of repentance and everything associated with it. But we have a problem. You see, God is holy. And it's not as simple as God opening up his arms as we turn around and repent and just embracing us. It's not that simple. Whether we're repentant or not, our sin still needs to be dealt with because God is holy. I lost my place, which is okay. God cannot simply pass over sin. Holiness requires justice. Every sin, every act of rebellion must be accounted for and, and accounted for in full measure. And that includes even the smallest sin, as if there is such a thing as a small sin. Every act of rebellion against the king must receive a ju its just consequence, or the kingdom of heaven will never fully manifest itself on earth. Which brings us to our second point. God himself must prepare the way. God, he must close this infinite gap between us and him, removing the obstacles that separate us from him. Which is exactly what baptism, which is going to be the focus of our message today, um, addresses. While we are responsible to repent and there's no salvation apart from repentance. Our repentance does not remove our sin. Our repentance doesn't remove it. We still need to be cleansed. And so why baptism? Well, I guess a better question would be, what is baptism? And I'd say baptism, in a very real sense, is a cleansing act. Now, of course, it's silly to think that water could wash away sin, right? Or can it? Can water, I'm, that's a serious question. Can water wash away the corruption of sin? This is from Genesis 6 and 7. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and filled with violence. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth, so make yourself an ark of gopher wood. I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground, and everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. God blotted out every living thing on the face of the ground, man and animals, and creeping things, and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him on the ark, in the ark. So the question is not whether or not water can cleanse away the corruption of sin. The question is how water 
cleanses away sin. You see, the entire earth was cleansed via water as an act of judgment. But in mercy, God spared a remnant, eight persons in all. Water was poured out upon the earth. The whole earth was plunged in water as an act of judgment. But a few were brought safely through those waters of judgment. And if you question whether or not that pertains to baptism, 1 Peter makes it clear. He says baptism, he uses the example of Noah, refers to this. It corresponds to this. And yet God, after that flood, he made a covenant with Noah, promising never again to destroy the earth and all creation through water as an act of judgment. At the same time, the Lord spares a people through those, I'm sorry, let's see. The waters, however, they continue to be used on a smaller scale as a symbol of salvation through judgment. So God promises never to destroy the whole earth again through a flood of water. But that does not discount God using that symbol throughout redemption history. Consider the Exodus. Pharaoh's army... All of it was plunged and destroyed in God's waters of judgment. And at the same time, God spared what? He spared a people. He spared a remnant through those exact same waters. And then again, the entire first generation of Israelites that crossed through the Red Sea onto dry land, they failed to go through and passed through the waters of the Jordan because they, were, they proved to be unfaithful. They failed to enter God's promise. Well, baptism is a portrait of cleansing away sin. Some, by God's grace, will pass through the waters of judgment, but many don't. Many do not pass through those waters, at least not in a saving way. The baptism of John... It was one of repentance because only the repentant are going to pass through those waters. So don't ever think the extent of what we can do is repentance and God has to do the rest. We have a big responsibility here to repent, which means those who pass through, those who are repentant, they also are those who are kept through judgment. Those are the ones who recognize they recognize, which is why they repent, recognize that they, that we are deserving of God's wrath, God's act of judgment, and turn to him for mercy. But get this, not everyone came to John to be baptized. The religious leaders didn't. They based their salvation or their standing with God on their genealogy. They were righteous in their own eyes. But John, John in turn warns everyone, not just the religious leaders, he warns everyone there. Verse 11, he's merely baptizing with water. But one is coming after who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And the difference is that between fire and water. Both. Fire and water, they serve as cleansing agents. Fire, however, cleanses in a way that's much more comprehensive than water. You see, water, it washes away filth. You know, you go to the sink, you wash your hands, you wash the mud, the dirt off them. Fire, it purifies any impurities. Both the spirit and fire is poured out upon the earth as a form of baptism. See, we'll see how in verse 12. Verse 12. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. All right, so we're going to look at this idea of the work of the Spirit as a form of baptism and the work of fire as a form of baptism. Uh, first, recognize that Jesus, he has not come to bring peace, as it were, on earth. At least not on earth as it is. Jesus himself will say that, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
Jesus has come to bring peace between God and those who repent. Those who will bear fruit. Those who will prove to be wheat. Jesus has come to divide, separating wheat, that which is wholesome, from the inedible chaff, that which would be the husk, as it were. Now, Jenny, she's begun milling her own grain lately, and I've never seen, and maybe you have, unground grain close up. It looks a lot like grass seed, except it's a little bit bigger, you know, a little bit more dense. Well, the farmer, the way he would go through this winnowing process is he'd take his winnowing fork, which looks a lot like a pitchfork, and he would grab some of that wheat and he'd lift it up and shake it. And in the process of doing that, the wind would carry the light husk, the light chaff, as it were, and separate it from the grain. The grain would fall back down to the threshing floor. So he'd be separating the edible grain and the inedible or worthless chaff. Now it's important to realize that this separating, this sorting, it is not a gentle process. There is some violence involved in here. He's got to shake that grain loose. And here's where the spirit comes into play. While the word spirit isn't actually in verse 12, it's in verse 11. And in verse 12, it is certainly a part of Jesus's or John's metaphor that he uses, if you understand it correctly. You see, the terms, and, and we cover this often, but it's so important to remember as you read through your Bible, the word for spirit and wind and breath, they're all the same. And that matters because a lot of times when the gospel writers or the, the biblical authors use breath or wind, they're also alluding to the Spirit. Not every time, but a lot of the time. So be aware of that. The agent, the agent, this farmer, who is Jesus, is using to separate the wheat from the chaff is wind. And in the case of souls, of men and women, it is the Holy Spirit. The chaff, the useless part, that which is not fruit, will be burned with unquenchable fire. Because for the most part, it's unbeneficial. It fails to add value to kingdom living. Get this. God has not planted you and me on this earth to be unbeneficial. But to spread life throughout the earth, which is the original creation mandate. To be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with God's righteous reign. The kingdom of heaven is come near. And when it comes in full manifestation, our Father's will will indeed be done on earth as it is in heaven. Nothing, absolutely nothing will remain that is not conformed for that kingdom. For the earth will, is about to be purged through both a baptism of the Spirit and of fire. A greater, more comprehensive baptism is coming, a baptism which will indeed cleanse the world from all sin, from all of it. But don't think that this baptism, being baptized with the Holy Spirit, is for one group over here, you know, these repentant ones, they're, they're the ones baptized with the Spirit. And... This baptism of fire is for this other group. That's, that's the group. They, did, they didn't repent, so they're being baptized with fire. Um, I don't think that's what Matthew has recorded here at all. It says he will baptize you with the Spirit and fire. Both are poured out upon the earth as a form of baptism. Both are part of the process to purge Everything not conformed to his kingdom. Now, what I'm not saying, and understand, I'm not saying that the believer is baptized with the Spirit in the same way the unbeliever is. There is a baptism with the Spirit that is different. And what is being recorded here in Matthew and being shared by John the Baptist, we got to be careful of, of putting Paul's words 
on Matthew. As if because they use the same phrasing, the same idea, it doesn't come through in the same sense. The Spirit is going to be poured out on the earth. And one of the works of the Spirit that he does, does is he convicts the world of sin. Okay? The, the Spirit's winnowing work, and I've lost my verse, but that is okay. He's going to convict the world of sin and righteousness. You know, let me just jump to John 16. I know where it is, even if it's not in my notes anymore. The Bible, it doesn't change. It doesn't move. Although sometimes, you know, I look in this book to find something, and I know what chapter it is, and I'm sure. And I keep looking, I never find it. So then I go type it up on my, my smartphone that can tell me where it is, and it tells me it was in the chapter I was looking at, but I just couldn't find it. All right. So... All right, the helper, when he comes, this is speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. All right. Here, this baptism is a purging and purifying process. For the unbeliever who continues in his unbelief, he will be blown away by the spirit of righteousness. He will be blown away like chaff. And that is Psalm 1. The wicked are like chaff that the wind drives away. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The spirit himself is going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Our Lord explains this winnowing process work. Yep, there it is, in John 16. It's in my notes. Good. We're not going to do that again. Those who do not believe will be purged, not simply by fire, but first by the Spirit himself. This winnowing refers to the separating of believers from unbelievers. And that may indeed be the extent of what John the Baptist was referring to. But... It is just as likely this applies to you and me in the individual sense as well. Not solely as one individual separated from a group, but the, the winnowing that takes place in each of our lives. Realize, individually, you and I, we have a lot of chaff in our life. A large portion of our lives is, not, is that which is not fruit. You know, there's a lot of our life that is still made up of waste, made up of worthless things. There's quite a bit of stuff in my life that as I look back over my week, if I do so soberly and honestly, and the Spirit convicts me and illuminates my eyes to see, there is a lot of parts of my life that have not been lived out to the glory of God. And I'm just going to guess, for some of you in this room, maybe all of you, but some of you in this room, that's true of you too. Every aspect of your life not lived to God's glory is chaff. It is. It's made up of the wrong kingdom. And it needs to be removed. Remember, the goal, the purpose of discipleship is what? It's conformity to Christ. And get this. No part of Jesus' life failed to be glorifying to the Father. No part whatsoever. And if that is our standard... Not your neighbor across the street, not your unbelieving friend, not even the person sitting next to you in the pew. That is not your standard. Your standard is the Christ, Jesus, the Son of God, who lived perfectly to the glory of God. So any aspect of our lives that is not lived that way needs to be removed. And that's the Spirit's role in mine in your life. It is to conform us to the image of Christ. And he does so by removing the chaff. And sometimes that is a 
violent process. It's not part of my message, but, you know, some of you might be going through some trials right now. And those trials are really hard. They are. But trust that the sovereign Lord knows what he is doing. And that if you just cling to Christ, you will be wheat that falls to the ground. And those trials will remove the chaff that's in your life. All right. God removes the chaff, convicting you and me of those things that are worthless in our lives, that they might be removed. Moving on. So on top of the food mill, sorry, Jenny, if I'm picking on you too much today, uh, in which Jenny grinds her own grain, I've discovered that there are some varieties of wheat that need to be sifted before they can just be ground into flour. So one day I find her, she's got her wheat in this um, little metal sieve or sifter uh, and she's holding over this bowl and she's dumped off her wheat berries in there and she is shaking this thing you know above this and we got this little white bowl so you can see the little things that are coming out and it's got a couple little black specks in there and I'm watching her do this while I'm sitting at the kitchen table working on something probably this message and she's shaking and shaking it and I go like I didn't realize you did that before you made bread every time and and she doesn't but some of the different varieties you get she says you got to because it's got you know different elements in it and so I'm looking I'm like that is a lot of work to make bread uh healthy bread for us and so she, you know she asks, well would you eat this do you want to eat this stuff and so I'm looking at it I'm like I mean there's not a whole lot there but by the time she was done after a couple minutes of just violently shaking this stuff there was a good cup of these black speck like beads and I'm just going to tell you I don't want to eat that stuff I don't know what's in our bread at the supermarket but I don't want to eat that well there are things in my life that aren't nutritious that's not fruit but chaff and there are things in your life that's still chaff perhaps at first glance it's not so noticeable when I looked at that the grain and that sifter that sieve I didn't see any of these black specks but in the bottom of the bowl, there it was. Our Lord is winnowing out even those things that are not so apparent. And be glad that he is, because all that chaff is going to be burned with unquenchable fire. It cannot enter his kingdom. And just as the Spirit serves as an agent of both judgment and salvation, so too does fire. Believers, at least in part, they will pass through the purifying fire of God's judgment. You see, we're not only cleansed, and that's, that's what water baptism represents, and we're not only winnowed and sifted, you know, removing the chaff from us, but fire purifies. We are purified as well which is where the fire comes in. Now, I might have grown up a little bit more backwoods than some of you, but when we would visit my grandma, when we go over to my grandma's house, and we did it quite regularly, we would all be banished. There, I have four other siblings, so we'd all be banished to outside to run around the house and climb trees because, well, I mean, in those days, you didn't have tablets and game consoles to keep the kids occupied and quiet. And my grandma's house was not a very big house. And so the last thing she was going to do is have five to however many of our cousins were over there inside making a ruckus. Well, more than a few times I came in with a, spl a good sized splinter in my hand that I was just not able to remove myself. And my grandma, she did not have a pair of tweezers lying around to go pull, you know, get a good hold of this thing and pull it out. So you know what she used to get the splinter out? Maybe some of you experienced this. A sewing needle. 
And she always got the splinter out every single time. She would just dig down there until she got it out, and she'd get it. There was never a splinter that she could not remove. Now, with my kids, we kind of let it fester until it kind of works its way out a little bit. But my grandmother was getting that thing out, and she was determined. But even as backwoods as we are, she understood that a dirty needle, an infected needle, will cause a lot more problems than any splinter that's left in your skin. So you know what she did besides just washing that needle? She'd go bar granddaddy's lighter and she would click that thing and she would burn the end of that needle. Why? To remove any impurities. There was no impurities left on the end of that needle. Once we've been sifted, we have to pass through the purifying fire of God's judgment. That chaff that has been sifted out of our lives has got to be burned up. None of it will remain, not even a trace. But in Christ, you and I are still going to walk through the fire. I hope you understand that. You and I will still walk through the fire. And yet not a hair on our heads is going to be singed. Not a hair will perish. This is Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as a ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, and peoples, nations, in exchange for you. A greater, more comprehensive baptism is coming. A baptism which we all must pass through. A baptism that will remove everything that hinders the full manifestation of God's kingdom on earth. This baptism will prepare the earth for the coming of the Lord who is coming again in his full righteousness. There will be those who, because of their union with Christ, who are going to withstand fire, the fire of God's judgment. And there will be those who will be burnt up. You see, it's not so much that the Lord has given nations in exchange for you. You see, the nations, they're but a drop in a bucket. The Lord himself will be with you through this baptism because the one given in exchange for you and me is himself. The Lord himself has given himself in exchange for us. And we're going to look at that closer next week. For right now, consider this. Jesus is the mighty one who holds the winnowing fork in his hand. And this Jesus is also meek and mild. A bruised reed he will not break. If we are to enter the kingdom of heaven, we need one who is mighty enough to hold this winnowing fork and thoroughly winnow the chaff out of our lives. but who is also gentle enough that something remains. That something remains when he is through. And praise the Lord that the one who holds the winnowing fork is Jesus himself and no one else. In Christ, you and I, we are new. We are new right now. Obviously not totally new, but genuinely new. 
And this winnowing process is perfecting that newness in you. Until you and I are completely new, all the way through to our very core. And we represent Christ, not exhaustively, but perfectly. Perfectly. The winnowing process will continue until every facet that doesn't conform to Jesus is blown away by the Spirit. So that you and I may be utterly set apart for God's glory. That chaff will be swept into a pile that is set ablaze until none of it remains so that you and I, that we can stand before the Lord Almighty, the Holy One, blameless and pure in his sight. That is the goal. And because Jesus is the one superseding or superintending this, it will happen. Let's pray. Father, how gracious and kind you are. I know that's how I begin most of my prayers, but it's true. You could blow us away as if we're all nothing but Jeff. But through your spirit, you have put newness in us, wholeness in us grain in us. We know that for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. So as unpleasant as this winnowing process may sometimes be, We ask that you continue it for our good and for your glory. Finish this work that you've begun in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.